You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is. Jacob Volk. Hello! Sports fans! Welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk. And I have to start this show off by recapping Heat Bucks and the incredible performance of Jimmy Butler. Playoff Jimmy Butler showed up against the Pacers and he's showing up against the Bucks. What he did yesterday was incredible. Dropping 40 points... I mean, that was a superhuman effort. He couldn't miss. And they were all on drives. They were all on penetrations. He only shot two threes. And you know what? He should have shot more because he made them both. He was insane. That's a career high for him. 40 points in a playoff game. And he scored 14 of those points in the fourth quarter. If you're going to pick a quarter to score 14 points in, the fourth quarter is a pretty good quarter to do that in, I would say. I mean, if the Heat can get these kinds of performances from him, I'm not saying 40 every night, but if they can get these consistent games from him where he's dropping 20 to 30 points... They're going to be a really tough out for the Bucks. I mean, I said yesterday that the Heat were going to give the Bucks trouble. It's why I picked Bucks in six. They're a very well-rounded team led by a proven playoff performer in Jimmy Butler. I mean, before the playoffs started, I was skeptical of him. He didn't have a great year. Wasn't really putting the team on his back. I mean, he was signed to a big contract, and I just wasn't impressed with what I saw from him. But you have to give him all the credit in the world for what he's been able to do. He dominates the Pacers series, and... He was by far and away the best player on the court yesterday. And what Butler did on the defensive end also can't be overstated. He locked down Giannis. Giannis only dropped 18. I understand he almost had a triple-double. Giannis is going to get his no matter what. Okay, he's Giannis. He's the freak. But... If you can limit him to just 18 points and you get him to the free throw line, you have a really good chance of winning. Giannis is not a good free throw shooter. I'll get into the Bucs in a minute, but something that Mike Budenholzer said kind of ticked me off. Fantastic all-around effort by Butler. Goran Dragic also... Great game, 27 points. Bam Adebayo continues to be really good in these playoffs. 12 points and 17 rebounds. The guy had 17 rebounds. He was doing something right. Jay Crowder was good on the glass also. This was a really well-rounded game by the Heat. It's why I said they can give the Bucks trouble. Speaking of the Bucks, you have to be a little scared if you're a fan of theirs right now. I'm not saying that because they lost yesterday. 
That doesn't bother me. They lost game one against the Magic, and then they won four straight. What bothered me was how bad Giannis looked. And he was up against Jimmy Butler for a lot of that game. Butler's a really good defender. But Giannis has gone up against good defenders before, and he's torched them. He didn't do that yesterday. He turned the ball over six times. He made 50% of his field goals. I like that. But he wasn't finishing through contact. The Heat had a game plan. If and when Giannis gets around you, foul him. Make him earn it. And that was a really smart strategy. Giannis only shot 63.3% from the charity stripe this year. Really good idea to foul someone like that. But even then, if he attempts 12 free throws, you'd expect him to make about 7 of them. Well, he only made 4. That doesn't work for me. You have to be better than that from the free throw line if you're Giannis. This is how teams are going to defend him. Going forward, if he gets around you, just make him earn it. It's a good strategy. It works. To put in perspective how bad Giannis was from the free throw line yesterday... That was the worst performance by anyone with at least 12 free throw attempts in a playoff game since Andre Roberson only hit two in a game for the Thunder when they were going up against the Rockets in 2017. And Mike Budenholzer said he's going to make those free throws. We have total faith in him. How can you have total faith in someone like that? Look, I don't want to kill Giannis. It's just one game. The Bucks can rebound from this. But this concerns me. This has to concern you if you're a Bucks fan. The Heat just laid out how they can beat you. Forget Jimmy Butler going off. Just send Giannis to the free throw line. It's the next element of his game. Also for the Bucks, I did say that Giannis would need help, and he got it. Giannis is the reason that the Bucks lost yesterday. Make no mistake about it. Chris Middleton balled out. He had 28 points. He was the high man for the Bucks. Brooke Lopez had 24 Four for six from beyond the arc. I mean, if Brooke Lopez could have done that for the Nets his whole career, he would have more than a four-point buffer on Buck Williams for most points by a net. You know, again, I don't want to kill Giannis too much. I love Giannis. He's my favorite player in the NBA to watch. But this was just an infuriating game to me. He didn't produce as well as he should have. Was dreadful from the free throw line. Wasn't good defensively. Jimmy Butler torched him. I mean, no one could stop Butler yesterday, but... Still, you're the freak. The Bucks are only going to go as far as you take them. You have to be their best player. If they're going to win. And you weren't yesterday. Moving on now to Rockets Thunder. And you remember how I said that Russell Westbrook had to be the second best player for the Rockets if they wanted to win? Well, I was right. And Mike D'Antoni agreed with me. He knew that. He made a concerted effort to get Westbrook more involved. He was handling the ball a lot, was distributing a lot. Unfortunately for them, 
Westbrook had a dreadful performance. If you weren't watching the game yesterday, Westbrook had two killer turnovers late in that game. Tied at 98, less than 90 seconds left. Chris Paul steals the ball from Westbrook. I mean, granted, the Thunder couldn't convert on the other end. I don't know how Steven Adams missed those two layups, but... Still, you have to keep the ball there if you're Westbrook. You can't allow the Thunder to get that golden opportunity. Then a little later on... It's 102-100 Thunder with less than 10 seconds left in the game. Westbrook has the ball. He's bringing it up court. He's looking to make a drive. And Chris Paul pokes the ball right out of his hands again. I mean, the story after the game was the performance of Russell Westbrook. That's what a lot of people were talking about. But you can't overlook what Chris Paul did. Two huge defensive plays, clutching up in the fourth quarter. He's so clutch. Chris Paul does not get credit for how clutch he really is. I mean, the guy had 15 points in the fourth quarter yesterday. To put that in perspective, Shea Gilgis Alexander only had 10. Dennis Schroeder only had 12. And this is for the whole game. They only had 10 and 12. Russell Westbrook only had 17 in the whole game. I mean, Chris Paul just took over. Imagine being a Rockets fan. You move mountains to trade Chris Paul for Russell Westbrook. You think Paul is past his prime You think he's massively overpaid. You have to attach four first-round picks to get the Thunder to agree to trade Westbrook. And twice, with the game on the line yesterday, Westbrook blows it to the guy he was traded for. If the Rockets do not win, Tomorrow, there are going to be about 50,000 calls to Texas sports talk radio stations screaming for blood. They will want D'Antoni gone. They will want Westbrook gone. They will want the whole team blown up. Daryl Morey may even... (laughs) have some calls for his head. You give up four first-round picks for a guy who puts up two stinkers in this series. I understand Game 5 he was hurt, but he still wasn't good. There's no excuse for that. Look, I like Westbrook. I respect the talent that he is. But at some point, maybe you just can't win with him. There are some players that just aren't conducive to winning. For whatever reason, they just don't have that clutch gene. I mean, let's look at the timeline. Kevin Durant left for the Warriors in 2016. So it's Russell Westbrook's team in 16-17. What did the Thunder do? They get bounced in five games in the first round to the Rockets. Yes, Westbrook had a great season. Averaged a triple-double. Something that only Oscar Robertson had ever done. But it didn't get the Thunder anywhere near a championship. The year after that, Sam Presti makes two huge trades for Paul George and Carmelo Anthony. The Thunder only finished with one more win in the regular season and one more win in the postseason. Westbrook, again, triple-double. Nowhere 
near a championship. The year after that, the Thunder have 49 wins. Westbrook, again, triple-double. The Thunder are bounced in five games in the first round to the Trailblazers. 2018, they lost to the Jazz, for whatever it's worth. At some point, you have to realize that this guy just doesn't have it anymore. There was a time when Russell Westbrook was the second best player on a team that made the NBA Finals. There was a point when this guy could be the second best player on teams that made three Western Conference Finals. He's not that player anymore. He's just concerned about his stats. He's concerned about accumulating as many big numbers as possible. Congratulations. He's going into the Basketball Hall of Fame. I don't think there's a question about that. And when you look at just the individual career of every single NBA player, You'd be hard-pressed to leave Westbrook off your list of top 100 NBA players of all time. I actually have him at 66. The guy's incredibly talented. You just can't win with him. I mean, I'll tell you, Mike D'Antoni got some heat for having Westbrook bring the ball up court. And being the guy with the ball in his hands late. That didn't bother me too much. At the end of the game, the second Paul Steele, that bothered me. But the first Paul Steele late, that didn't bother me. Because we don't know what that play was really going to be. Maybe it was designed to free up Harden. I mean, at the end of the day, Westbrook is the born point guard. He's not a great passer, but he's not a terrible one. He's better than Harden. Harden's not a bad passer either, but Westbrook is just a better passer than Harden. You know, at the end of the day, you want the ball in your point guard's hands so that way he can set up a play, or the coach can set up a play. Unless you're going to run an ISO for James Harden, Westbrook needs the ball in his hands there. It really didn't bother me. This was a really exciting game. Danilo Gallinari had a great game. He dropped 25. He's having a really good playoffs. Always liked Gallinari. I remember once upon a time, I wanted him on the nets. Lugans Dort rebounded to have a much better game. Not as good defensively, but much better offensively. He shot 5 for 9 from the field. He had 13 points. I'll take it. Steven Adams dominated on the interior. He just didn't get the opportunity to score a lot. What else is new? Game 7 tomorrow is going to be a dogfight. It's going to be a great game. Westbrook is going to be ticked off. He's going to want to go off for a million points. If Westbrook really is a clutch player, tomorrow he has to ball out. It's just that simple. But now it's time to preview today's two games. I'll start with Celtics-Raptors. For the Celtics, they really don't have to change much. I mean, can you expect Marcus Smart to go off for 21 points again? to shoot 60% from the field and hit five out of his nine three-point tries? No, you can't. But you can expect Tatum to go off again. You can expect Kemba to go off again. You can expect Jalen Brown to go off again. And defensively, you can expect every single Celtic to clamp. Kemba Walker is not a great defender, but everyone else on the Celtics really is. 
Tatum, Brown, Tice, Smart, Robert Williams. They're all really good defenders. Get the ball out of Smart's hand. Don't try to catch lightning in a bottle twice. And stick with your defensive game plan from game one. As for the Raptors, just tighten up. You can't allow Marcus Smart to go off again. And you can't have another dismal shooting performance. If you go down 2-0, I don't see you coming back. I don't think this is a Raptors team that's going to win four out of the other five games. Play through Kyle Lowry. Play through Serge Ibaka. Of course, get Siakam involved. Of course, get Van Vliet involved. But at the end of the day, I think the Celtics are going to clamp them. If the Raptors are going to win this game, it's going to have to be because of Lowry and Ibaka. Moving on now to Jazz Nuggets. And it's pretty simple what both teams need to do. They need to play through their stars. They need to play through their fantastic young players. Specifically, Donovan Mitchell and Jamal Murray. I'm not saying anything that isn't common knowledge, but I can't make anything up. It's pretty simple that that's what they need to do. This series has turned into a battle between those two. I mean, quite frankly, if we could turn this game into just a one-on-one matchup, first one to 40 wins, I'm all for that. Hell, you know what? Make it 50. Let's let it go longer. Yes, the Jazz are going to look to get Gobert, Conley, and Clarkson involved. Yes, the Nuggets are going to look to get Jokic involved. And Michael Porter Jr. also. But at the end of the day, this game is going to come down to Mitchell versus Murray. Whichever one of them scores more points will win this game. Moving over now to the NHL, and I'll start by recapping Bruins Lightning. A great, great, great game. The Bruins played with a fire under their ass. They outplayed the Lightning tremendously in this game. They outshot the Lightning in regulation, and it wasn't even close. They outshot him 35-21. to And in the first overtime, too, they outshot the Lightning, 11-7. to And the goals that the Bruins scored, I thought were better goals. The Pasternak goal on the power play was the result of a great fake slap shot by uh, Krejci. He gets the puck to Pasternak. No one's expecting it. And Pasternak snipes it home. And then Krejci scored himself. Chara with a deflected pass. Krejci keeps his eye on the puck. And he ties the game at two late. The two lightning goals in regulation were deflections. They were goals that Yaroslav Halak didn't have a chance on. But they were also goals that really could have gone either way. I mean, when you deflect the puck, it's really hard to angle it where you want it to go. I've seen a lot of deflections go wide of the net. I mean, the Bruins were on Palat. They were on Sorelli. They were defending them well. Sometimes the puck just has a way of finding itself in the back of the net. But Vasilevsky stood on his head. Other than those two goals, he made 45 saves. And in the second overtime, the Lightning dominated. The Bruins were tired. 
They were gassed. You could see it. They outshot the Bruins 7-1. to one. And of course it's Victor Hedman who ends up scoring the goal to send the Lightning to the conference finals. He gets the puck at the point. He keeps the puck away from Carlo and he just snipes it home. Victor Hedman has had a great playoffs. If we gave out the Norris Trophy for just the playoffs, it's a fair bet to say that Hedman would win it. Moving on now to Stars Avalanche. And the Stars decided to put their starter in net, Ben Bishop, Okay to play. And look, I thought it was the right decision when I heard about it. I was surprised that Bishop played. I didn't know he was close to coming back, but evidently he was. He couldn't have played much worse. He allowed four goals on 19 shots. It was so bad that Bishop got pulled before the end of the first period. Yeah, that's right. The Avalanche had at least 19 shots in the first period yesterday. They had 23 total. They scored 6 goals despite going 0 for 6 on the power play. I mean, they played for their goalie. It's just that simple. Jared Bednar listened to me. He started Michael Hutchinson. And Hutchinson was okay. He gave up three goals, but he made 31 saves. I'll take that from Hutchinson. I can't expect anything more from him. Obviously, Bednar is going to go back to Hutchinson for Game 6. Assuming Grubauer can't play. I'm sure he can't, but... I didn't think Bishop was going to play in this game, so what do I know? It is going to be interesting to see who Rick Bonus goes with. Kudobin hasn't looked great in the playoffs, but after what Bishop did yesterday, how can you confidently start him again? Obviously, I'm not 100% confident in Bishop's ability to come through, but I feel like he has to start Game 6. At the end of the day, I'd want to try to get my starting goalie going. I have to give him more than one game. Also, it's worth noting for the Avalanche that Pavel Francouz wasn't even the backup for Hutchinson yesterday. It was Hunter Miska, a guy who's only played one game in the NHL. He only has 18 minutes to his name. He made eight saves on nine shots in a game for the Coyotes. This is your moment, Michael Hutchinson. I mean, I picked the Avalanche to win, so if they're going to, it's all on you, buddy. All right, now it's time to preview today's two games. And, obviously, I will start with Islanders Flyers. For the Islanders, start Varlamov. I understand that Grice played well on Sunday, but at the end of the day, Varlamov has just been so great throughout these playoffs. Yeah, he had the bad start to Game 2, but... Besides that, he's been great. You have to go back to him. Other than that, that's pretty much it. Just keep doing what you're doing. Pajot, Barzell, Ali, Nelson, Bailey, Eberly, Beauvillier. Keep clamping down on D, Pellick, Pulock, Mayfield, Taves, Green, Letty. I truly believe that the New York Islanders will win tonight and they will clinch their first appearance in the Eastern Conference Finals 
since 1993, before I was born. So great. As for the Flyers, you have to keep the puck in the Islander zone. I understand that's easier said than done, but your forecheck in the second period on Sunday was absolutely fantastic. There's no other word for it. You outshot the Islanders 17-3. to You have to keep that up. I know it's easier said than done. But this is an Islanders team that is susceptible to being outshot. It is susceptible to giving up some pretty good opportunities. It's up to you as a team to convert on them. Moving on now to Canucks Golden Knights. And for the Canucks, their defense really needs to step up. I have very little faith in Jacob Markstrom at this point. I think he's going to enter this game defeated. He's going to enter feeling like he's already lost. His body language during Game 4 really scared me. I said this yesterday. He looked really upset, but not upset in a good way. Upset in a self-doubting way. I don't want my goalies to self-doubt. I want them to be confident in themselves. I want them to have short memories. Yes, study what worked and what didn't work, but don't dwell on it. And I'm looking for the defense for the Canucks to really step up and make life easier for Markstrom. As for the Golden Knights, I want them to play through their big guns. Namely, Max Pacioretty, Mark Stone, Shea Theodore, and Robin Lehner. Get those four guys cooking, and you're going to the Western Conference Finals. Yes, guys like Smith and Marchesol and Stastny and Carlson and Schmidt will get theirs, but I'm looking at their top four to really step up tonight and clinch their second Western Conference Finals berth in their first three years of existence. Absolutely unreal. Yesterday, I posted the show kind of late, like 5 o'clock. That's not late late, but it's later than usual. I made a promise to you that you'll get the Jacob Volk show every afternoon. 5 o'clock is the afternoon. So, I wasn't really late, but like I said, it's later than you're used to. I did that because I wanted to wait to react to all the big MLB trades. And I really thought I got them all. But then I found out about the returns on the Brian Goodwin and Cameron Mabin trades. So, I'll talk about them now. So that way, I will have recapped every single big trade that happened on this surprisingly active deadline day. The Reds got Goodwin for Packy Norton and Cash, or the proverbial player to be named later. Goodwin is a solid backup outfielder. He hits 250, has some power, has some speed. Not the greatest fielder in the world, but not bad by any stretch. The Reds did need to add a backup outfielder. Outside of Nick Castellanos and Jesse Winker, they've gotten no production at the outfield position. Nick Senzel's been hurt. Shogo Akiyama has been dreadful. 
I mean, even then, Winker has been DHing more than anything. So, it makes sense for them to go after Goodwin. As for Norton, he's very deceptive in his delivery. He throws from a weird angle, which makes for an interesting watch, if nothing else. He has a good fastball, a decent curveball, a great changeup, though. I mean, his changeup just falls off a shelf. I really think we're going to see him start in the bigs at some point. I know why the Reds did this, but I think Norton is going to be a good contributor for the Angels in the future. Much better than Goodwin will be for the Reds. So, I'm going to say that the Angels won this trade. As for the Maven trade, the Cubs got him from the Tigers for Zach Short. When Maven was with the Yankees, I absolutely loved him. I wanted the Yankees to bring him back. Unfortunately, they didn't. And Maben has been a solid backup for the Tigers. He's hitting 244. I'll take it. That's acceptable for a backup outfielder. And much like the Reds, the Cubs benefit greatly from adding another outfielder. Kyle Schwarber has not been good this year. Ian Happ and Jason Hayward have, but that's pretty much it. Albert Almora has been dreadful. Steven Souza has been dreadful. It makes sense for them to add Mabin. As for Short, he is all defense, no offense. Great glove, great arm, putrid bat. He reminds me a lot of Tyler Wade when I watch him play, and I don't like Tyler Wade. He doesn't have the speed that Wade has, but he has the glove that Wade has. He's not as versatile as Wade, but as a shortstop, he reminds me a lot of Wade. It may not be the best comparison in the world, but unfortunately, I've seen Wade a lot, so that's who he immediately reminded me of. The Cubs easily won this trade to me. I don't see Short contributing much in the majors. Mabin will give them a solid outfielder who can start in a pinch. He's better as a backup, but I saw him start for the Yankees. He got the job done. It's a good move for the Cubs. It makes a ton of sense. Moving on now to an interesting piece of hockey news. And this is from Frank Saravalli of TSN. He put Patrick Laine on his trade bait board. That is exactly what it sounds like. And when your name appears on that board, you better take notice. I understand that the Jets disappointed. They lost in the qualifying round to the Flames. And the 2018 Conference Finals, when they lost to the Golden Knights, seems like an eternity ago. But this is Patrick Laine we're talking about. Patrick Laine is one of the most underrated young guns in the NHL. He has never had less than 50 points In a season, he has never had less than 28 goals in a season. If Patrick Laine is truly available, every single team in the NHL should be in on him. He's 22 years old, for God's sake. What are the Jets thinking? Patrick Laine is not the issue with the Jets. The issue with the Jets is that they're top-heavy. Outside of Kyle Connor, Mark Scheifele, Blake Wheeler, 
Line A, Nick Ellers, and Neil Pionk. There's no one who scares me on that team to put the puck in the net. Connor Hellebuck is a really good goalie, but he needs help. Kevin Cheveldioff needs to make a concerted effort to bring in scoring on the bottom six and at least two quality defensemen. I understand it's easier said than done. The Jets don't have a lot of cap space. They have some bad contracts on the books, like Cody Eakin, Dmitry Kulikov, and Matthew Parole. But at the end of the day, if the Jets are going to win anytime soon, that's what they need to do. Until tomorrow, I am Jacob Valk saying that the team that I fear the most is my own.